Thank you and welcome. My name is Greg Gorga, Executive Director here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I appreciate all of you braving this extreme Santa Barbara weather. <laughs> and happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Uh, we are here tonight to listen to uh, Great Whites and Mermaids by Ralph Clevenger. Very excited, of course, uh, in conjunction with our exhibit, Face-to-Face uh, -face with the Great Whites, uh, which we opened back in October with Ralph. And he has been always been a joy to work with. So we are very excited. You're in for a treat tonight. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Ralph in a minute. But I do want to um, acknowledge all of our board members here tonight, including our board president, Wilson Carre. Uh, raise your hand, our board members. Thank you. Uh, also want to acknowledge, uh, I think I have three past presidents here tonight. Ken Clements, where are you, Ken? Right here. Gail Anakushin, who's also our treasurer back there, thank you. And always amazing and wonderful to have the incredible Jean Schuyler here uh, in her Valentine's red coat, too, which I love, Jean. All right, we uh, would not be out here without Jean and her late husband, Barry, so thank you. I uh, also want to thank our, our sponsor tonight, Marie Morris Rowe. Uh, always want to thank our, our, uh, our food donations, uh, August Ridge Winery, Giordano's, Martellata Wines, and Nothing But Cakes, and Spices and Rice, so thank you to all of them. Everybody get a cupcake? All right. Uh, Nothing But Cakes is out in Goleta on Cali Real and August Ridge over on Figueroa Street, their tasting room. I hope you, you go there and visit them and mention the Maritime Museum. I don't know you, if you'll get a free wine, but you should mention them anyway. Uh, I want to thank TV Santa Barbara here, uh, here today. As always, we will record this and put it up on our website. Um, and then I want to uh, just mention some upcoming events. Uh, we, have, we are uh, in the middle of our marine science program, and these are some of our students who just in the past few weeks uh, have been out on the local fishing boat Stardust, and they become hands-on marine scientists, collecting marine life, talking about it, uh, touching some of it and then putting it back in the ocean. Uh, we have put 372 students on board already and we still have eight more classes to go. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> totally free of charge. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, our foundations and donors. Uh, a lot of these kids coming from North County, but even some of our local students have never seen the ocean, never been out on a boat and certainly never been able to touch marine life like this. Uh, in, in the, uh, on the water. So uh, really a wonderful program and I thank you for, for all of you who helped support that. Uh, it's been a little crazy this year with the weather, but we've gotten most of the kids on, on the boat. Don't always go leave the dock, but we try. <laughs> uh, we're also in the middle of our heavy science night uh, season where our docents and volunteers go out to schools and uh, participate in local school science fairs. And this year the kids are building their own lighthouses and learning about refracted light. Uh, which is really fun. Uh, last year, I know we uh, reached out and interacted with more than 3,000 students. So, uh, yeah, isn't that incredible? Uh, not happening at the uh, Maritime Museum, but I'll put in a shameless plug. Uh, anybody been to Night Lizard Brewery on Lower State Street there in the 600 block? Yeah. A few drinkers out there, good. All right. Uh, so I will be there on a week from Saturday, February 23rd at 2 p.m., and I'll be giving a very short presentation on 13,000 years of local maritime history. I talk very fast. Uh, it's uh, first come, first serve. Get it? First serve? We're at a brewery? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, so I don't know. There's, uh, but if you, uh, we'd love to see you, some of you down there. Uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, and you can jeer at me, whatever you want to do. Don't throw, don't throw your beer at me, though, whatever you do. Uh, February 27th, we have another family night. Uh, that is a, a, a Channel Islands theme, uh, so if you have young children, have gr young grandchildren, uh, it is a wonderful event. We have s five or six different activities, tables throughout uh, the museum, and uh, beverages for the parents. March 14th is our uh, next lecture. It will be titled, The Refugio Incident, A Wildlife Responder's Perspective by Eileen Ibera. And then March 29th, uh, we have already sold out our annual fundraiser. Uh, USO uh, Stars and Stripes, uh, but you can still put in a bid. If you're not attending, you can still bid on some of our live auction items. Uh, we have one of those fire hose flags uh, uh, created uh, by the Pierre Clayson's uh, Veterans Foundation. 
using fire hoses from uh, the Montecito Fire Department. And we are also auctioning off a Crystal Cruise uh, luxury suite cruise for two people. So, uh, yeah, isn't that nice? Yeah. Really wonderful. From Costa Rica to San Diego, it's uh, amazing. The, the, and those cruise lines, the, the Crystal Cruises are beautiful. Beautiful vessels, everything included. Uh, and then in April, we're bringing in uh, author Robin Lloyd uh, for a talk called Harbor of Spies, a novel of Hist historic Havana. Um, we did take our, speaking of historic, we did take our 101-year-old ranger, our flagship, uh, one, the first donation really to the Maritime Museum out of the water uh, this last week. Unfortunately, she's gonna need a lot of repair work uh, on the through hulls, so we're, uh, we're gonna be doing a small campaign to help fund that, so if anybody, uh, uh, is, has the ranger near and dear to their heart. We'd love to chat with you and uh, possibly have your support for that project. And uh, we always appreciate those of you who are members of the Maritime Museum, those of you who are Navigator Circle members, and also our flagship society members, those of you who have your uh, senior plan giving. And if you're interested in any of those things uh, and are not currently members of any of those and you want to talk to myself or any of the board members who raised their hands, I encourage you to do so. Before I introduce Ralph, I want to mention and brag a little bit that I was uh, with Ralph on one of his cage diving trips down to Guadalupe Island uh, about three years ago. And Ralph's going to have, I think, some photos from the uh, trip. There's certainly some of the, the exhibit photos are from that trip. And the Maritime Museum, with the help of Ed Stetson, who puts these trips together, is sponsoring with the Historical Diving Society a trip on October 12th to October 17th. I gotta tell you, I went last year, it's a five day trip, you're on the boat the whole time, and it's an amazing experience. Uh, and I had the pleasure of, and you really get to know that your fellow divers. So last, uh, three years ago, uh, one of, uh, a gentleman by the name of Leslie Leaney uh, joined us. Leslie moved here from England, and in the early 90s, started the, co-founded the Historical Diving Society. He was one of our founding board members. Uh, he's a current board member. Uh, and, uh, and we got to dive together, and it's really a bonding experience. In fact, he insisted that I share the cage with him on all eight dives, and we got really close. I mean, he actually called me his chum the whole time, <laughs> which I think is British for best friend. I'm pretty sure it's British for best friend. Uh, but we do have flyers on this trip. Uh, uh, you can grab one on your way out. You can come talk to Ed, who is here, or myself afterwards, and, uh, and we would love to have you join us on that trip. It is the trip of a lifetime, I will tell you. So as I mentioned, we are very excited to have uh, Ralph here. Ralph grew up on the coast of North Africa and began diving in the waters of the Mediterranean Sea at the age of seven with his father. He eventually went on to study zoology at San Diego State University. My wife is also an Aztec. Uh, and worked at Scripps Institution of Oceanography as a diver biologist before attending Brooks Institute of Photography. Based in Santa Barbara here, Ralph is pursuing his passion for the natural world by specializing in location photography and video projects of echo travel, environmental portraits, wildlife, and undersea subjects. He's traveled throughout the world on assignment for clients such as Fox Sports, U uh, University of California, California State Parks, Denali National Park Wilderness Center, National Marine Sanctuaries, McGalvery and Freeman Films, Light and Motion Industries, and others. His publication credits include Audubon Afar, uh, Audubon Afar, Islands, Oceans, Nature's Best, Outside, uh, uh, Orion Nature Quarterly and National Geographic, Terra Sauvage and other national and international publications. He is the author of the book Photographing Nature, published by New Writers. He was a senior faculty member as a prestigious Brooks Institute, at the prestigious Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara for 33 years. Uh, which is he must have started when he was 13 there, I think, uh, and teaches course, uh, courses in natural history and underwater photography there among photo and video courses. So please join me in welcoming Ralph Clevenger. All right, thank you very much. Let me lower this a little bit. And if you can't hear me, let me know, and I'll speak louder. Um, I need to get my PowerPoint up. And I can just skip the whole first third of my PowerPoint because he just told you everything. <laughs> OK. OK. 
All right, so um, I think what we're going to do is um, I'm going to go, go through the, the, the talk, and then at the end, um, if you have questions I, so that I can see you, because I can't see you right now, then we'll do the questions at the end. But I can go back to any picture in the presentation if you have a question about a specific picture. So I'll be able to go back and do that. Um, it's been really great the last couple of years. Um, I mean, I've worked with the Maritime Museum for 20 years, but it, <clears throat> recently they invited me back to do this Great White Show, and it's been really great to get back and get involved again. So if you haven't seen that show yet, it's pretty impressive. And the museum owns it, and they're going to be traveling with it. So um, We all have to start somewhere. And um, Greg Gate gave you a little rundown on where I started, but I want, sort of want to um, go over some of that again. I was very fortunate while at San Diego State to um, work at the Birch Aquarium at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and made lifelong friends and lifelong clients based on that. Um, and I did work there as a, as a diver and a, and a biologist, and I quickly learned that uh, working as a diver, as a career, can be sort of short <laughs> because um, it's incredibly difficult work and very hard and you know you better have something else to do. So I decided that maybe I could do some photography. Um, and while I was there, I, I did get my first underwater camera. It was a Konica C35 Marine. So it's shot film, of course. Um, I mean, look at the diving gear. There's no BCs involved. Uh, no, oct I still don't dive with an octopus. So if you run out of air, you got to go find somebody else, uh, or we'll do our old style buddy breathing. Uh, and I use flash bulbs with this. I don't know if you've ever seen a flash bulb go off underwater. It's a little scary um, because they explode. That's how they work, you know. So, so um, but it, it was it was great. It it, it got me hooked on underwater photography, um, really. So. I heard about a school in Santa Barbara that had an underwater photography course, and so I, I graduated from San Diego State in zoology and then came to Santa Barbara to study photography, which I had no idea you could actually make a living doing. Um, so I met Ernie Brooks, Jr. Um, he had this boat, Just Love, it's a converted trawler, um, and he had really cool toys. He had this submarine, and he had an airplane. and. Um, and he loved to do stuff, so I helped work on films with him and dove with him and met people that I've now dove with in, in many situations who are you know, well-established underwater filmmakers and photographers. But Ernie was really a mentor for me. Um, I actually took my final course in underwater photography with just him, just him and me, which was pretty amazing. And one of the things that I, in watching Ernie underwater, one of the things that I, I thought about was was how he would find this beautiful place. He wouldn't swim around too much and find this beautiful place, and then he'd just wait for something to show up. It's, it's a little bit scary sometimes doing that, if you, if you kind of think about it, because you're just sitting there by yourself. Um, it's really hard to do underwater photography with a buddy. So <clears throat> my buddy system is, hey, look, we'll get in the water together, and then we don't see each other until we get out of the water. Um, so anyway. Um, uh, I, I called it, you know, um, he, he was so patient and so calm underwater. I called it patient calmness. And, and I, tr I taught my students in underwater photography to do similar um, types of behavior underwater to get the images. So I graduated from Brooks and I, fi I had to make a living. Um, and I quickly figured out that I couldn't make a living in doing underwater photography and nature photography because those are really fun things and everybody can do them and it takes a lot of money to do it. So I became a commercial photographer, but out the outdoor world was my studio. So um, our, my primary business was in stock photography, you know, where you take the pictures and then hope somebody buys them. It's a very speculative business, but um, it was very successful for us, just as an idea, the, ice, the iceberg that I created um, grossed $1.2 million. Um, I didn't get all that, I only got about, <laughs> I only got about 40%, um, but it certainly helped my son go through college and 
you know, pay for the house. So, so I learned from some of the best out there uh, in terms of how to create images that buyers want to use. And a lot of it had to do with composites. Um, very early Photoshop work on the left and then a, a more extensive piece on the right. Um, but just to give you an idea, and I just picked underwater pictures now, an idea of the kind of money that some types of images generated. Um, uh, so when it, when it says a single sale, that means a client pr licensed that image for one use and paid that much. The multiple sales means it, it could be 100 sales or 200 sales. Um, and you're not really selling pictures, it's, you're leasing pictures, because I, I own the copyright to all the pictures. So, but it's pretty amazing, because many of you are looking at this going, God, I have way better pictures than that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very true. All of these were shot on film, um, uh, and, and it's very true. But, but the thing is, is that I learned how to create images that, that you buyers wanted to use. It's different than just creating pic pretty pictures. So anyway, it was, it, it, it was a great market. Um, uh, it's no longer really viable to make a living in stock photography, which is pretty incredible. So a lot of changes have happened. Um, also part of our business, and my wife was my business manager, fortunately, because I still had a full-time job teaching and doing this. So we ran a, a business for um, whatever it was, 30 years or so. 33 years. <clears throat> so I did a lot of magazine work, getting assignments and traveling, um, Caribbean, local areas, Ireland. I wrote articles for magazines <clears throat> on not only underwater stuff, but others. And I wrote this book. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life was write this book. Uh, um, I mean, you know, I'm a photographer. If I wanted to be a writer, I would have thrown all that gear out of there and just picked up a pencil and paper, which is not a bad idea. Um, but, but still, the writing, um, uh, I had to become a writer to, to, to make it successful. But it was very, very satisfying. <clears throat> and then most of, <clears throat> a lot of my income actually came from doing commercial assignments. So clients would hire me to go and do photography. And it had very little to do with underwater many times or with nature. Um, but I went to Brooks Institute of Photography. Um, I was a high, I'm a highly trained commercial photographer. I can photograph pretty much anything and at least do a good job at it. So that was one of the great things about the education at Brooks. Um, you know, for the last, oh, 12, 15 years, our primary, um, maybe a little longer now, but our primary uh, business um, market has been in ecotourism, where we travel around the world to, to eco lodges and things, and they hire us to photograph everything. The lodges, the interiors, the food, the people, the, and then what you're gonna see in the activities and the whole thing. So this is an example from an African lodge. And I, I do photograph people. Um, uh, some people said, well, you never seem to photograph people. Well, um, when my son was born, I was required to photograph people. Um, and I, I learned to, to love photographing people. And I've been really fortunate to, um, to photograph some of you know, my, my heroes and things. Chuck Nicklin on the left and Stan Waterman, who, who was at, worked on the Blue Water White Death movie that had a big impact on me. So, um, in fact, the Stan Waterman portrait was taken right here. Um, so anyway, so, so pretty much anything to do with the outdoor world is what I've been photographing. So I'm pro-tired now, which is different than retired. But I'm pro-tired now, so my wife and I, we bought this little trailer, we travel, I go diving. Um, she doesn't really like boats that much. Um, but uh, so I go diving and take pictures everywhere we go. We just got back from three weeks in Norway in the dead of winter, which was an adventure. Um, and, and, you know, we do it for fun now. So that's what I see retirement as being about. Okay, so Brooks Institute of Photography. So I, I didn't start when I was 13. Um, <laughs> I was 30 when I started teaching there. Um, but it was a long time ago. I mean, um, the school has been closed for almost three years now, and <clears throat> when it closed, I had taught there for 33 years. Um, 
But the underwater photo program was one of the unique programs there. It was, it was unique in the world, um, certainly for a, a, a university. And um, it was started in the 60s by Ernie Brooks Sr., and that's the gentleman on the left, um, and Ernie Brooks Jr. is on the right. So that was at the pool at the Montecito campus um, at the Greyholm Estate that they had the school at. So what they, what they decided was that a shore-based underwater photography class didn't give students enough time in the water. So Ernie decided to take his boat. Um, it was about 57 feet long, and um, he turned it into an underwater um, photography classroom where um, an instructor and Ernie would come out many times. It could take uh, 12 students. Um, most of them slept on deck, um, and um, they would dive. We would spend almost four weeks out there, not continuously, but a long time. And the students, of course, it's film, remember, so you're taking all these pictures, and then you got to wait until you get back to Santa Barbara and get them processed to see what you've done. It's a really hard way to learn um, something like photography. But people from all over the world came here to learn from Ernie and, and learn underwater filmmaking and photography. And Ernie, um, during this period, Ernie became the world's most renowned underwater black and white photographer. So it's pretty amazing stuff. So I took over the class about 20 years ago, and um, pretty motley looking crew there. Um, but you can see all the gear that we're using. <clears throat> and the, the, in the class, we would teach everything about underwater photography. You, you know, how to maintain all your equipment, what the equipment did, and there's a lot of equipment. I want to go back to that uh, coming back in my next life as a writer. Um, <laughs> There is a lot of equipment. It's very expensive. Um, an average um, DSLR housing runs anywhere from four to ten thousand dollars, and that's without the lights and the camera and the lens. So it's an incredibly expensive field to get into. But but we taught we we taught everything. We taught the students what an O-ring was and why you needed to work properly. Um, we taught students the physics of light underwater and how you know, every, how things change underwater and what the heck Snell's circle is. Uh, this is an optical effect underwater. Um, and so the students would, would learn everything they needed to know about underwater photography and filmmaking. Um, and then on the boat, when the students would go on the boat, we wanted to create people who would work seamlessly uh, in underwater uh, photographic expeditions. So you were part of a crew. Your job may not be necessarily be to take pictures. You were just part of the crew. So they, they crewed the boat. They bought the groceries. They cooked the food. Um, Ernie taught them navigation. He let them drive the boat. Uh, they had to do watches when we were underway at night. Um, they had to clean the boat when we got back. So they, they learned everything they needed about being a good sea person and working as a team. Um, and every once in a while, Ernie would say, you know, let's go somewhere. And um, because he had this boat and that plane, and uh, he didn't have the submarine at this point, he, we would take off for Baja for six months. Um, this was a great job. <laughs> um, I would say, well, what about my other classes, Ernie? Oh, well, we'll get somebody else to do those, and you just need to come with me. So I, I would never go for the whole six months. I did have to do some teaching. But, um, but I was in charge of most of the logistics on a lot of these trips. And um, so, you know, I would, I would bring students down. We'd fly them down and let them go out on the boat for a few weeks. And then they'd come back. And um, it, it was really an incredible experience um, for everybody involved. And then we did get out to Socorro Island um, off of the coast of Mexico, which is, what, 280 miles um, off the coast. And, for that little boat to go out there, it, you know, it took, the boat only did 12 knots, and that's on a flat, calm sea. Um, we were coming back one time, and there was a big storm moving in, and the boat was actually moving backwards um, <laughs> because the wind was so strong. So, but, but we had incredible experiences out there. So then, <clears throat> um, Ernie, uh, in 1990, late 99, um, uh, Ernie retired. 
and sold the school and sold the boat. And so we transitioned um, to Glenn Fritzler's Truth Aquatics and we, we chartered the truth to go out and do the class. So everything kind of changed at that point. Um, we had actual bunks with, with pillows and towels and things, not up on the deck. Um, we were still doing film, so Glenn let us put an E6 film processor in the changing room. So we permanently mounted an E6 film processor, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so we could process the students' images that they had shot that day, and, they, and then we would look at them and critique them and talk about them. So the learning curve for the students went up very quickly. Um, and we also did a lot of video at that time, taking tripods underwater and doing big setup shots with, um, with lighting and things. And we got involved with a, another Brooks alum uh, person, Louis Preslin, who invented the Louis lights, which Cousteau used. Louis used to dive with Jacques Cousteau. So we, we really upped the production value and the learning processes for the students at this time. And one of the big things about working, especially one of the things I, I, I like teaching underwater photography in the Channel Islands, because if you can do well here with the low visibility situations, if you can do well here, you can, you can make films and take pictures anywhere in the world. So that was another big component. How do I create an image, because I have a job to do, how do I create an image in non-ideal conditions? So, <clears throat> The students um, in the course at that time had to be advanced scuba certified. And we would do four trips to the Channel Islands. Our courses were seven, seven to eight weeks long. Four trips to the Channel Islands and they would spend 14 days at sea. That's a lot of immersive time. And, and this is why the, many of the graduates were so good at what they did. Then in about um, 2000, 2001, the digital age arrived and Brooks transitioned from film-based to, to digital-based and that changed everything again. So we had to pull the processor out of the changing room because we didn't need it anymore. <clears throat> and so we, we did a lot more work, like we, we, um, we used Los Baños pool and students would do all their testing in the pool, much more comfortable environment. Digitally, they can see what they're doing a lot quicker. Um, we, we have all these tests of equipment, like this thing with these ACE hardware buckets. That's a, a focus test that Stephen Frank, uh, a Florida underwater photographer, um, designed and I borrowed. Um, and then we had all these little floating, like see that little shark right there? All these little floating things in there and students could take pictures of that to practice macro and stuff. Um, and they learned about their dome, you know, their equipment again, the optics of dome ports and things. And, but so much work was being done in the pool um, that I sort of started to add components of what, what I called shallow water photography. Um, and then um, the funding dried up a little bit and I couldn't get my four trips out to the ocean. So this presented a huge problem for me, for me, because I had to redesign the course. But what I realized, so I only had one trip, one five-day trip, and we went to a semester system, so I had uh, 15 weeks of class and one five-day trip for an underwater photography class. We didn't own a pool either. So, so I had to rethink about, rethink the market. You know, how, are, how can these people go out and use this to make an income? Because that's what they're there for. So what I realized was you didn't need to be a scuba diver to do underwater photography. And so the criteria for the class was all you have to do is get your camera wet. So yes, you could take pictures in the shower or the bathtub or the kiddie pool or the slip and slide or the mud hole or whatever. It's just the criteria you had to have a waterproof camera system. The optics are all the same and all that, but, and most students, I mean, weren't getting scuba certified. <clears throat> they could do their work in the pool without scuba. In fact, it's better. Um, you don't have all those bubbles. So I, 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 I did my homework, and so this opened up a lot of stuff about doing um, aquatic sports. Um, huge market. 
So students, we would go down to Ledbetter Beach and shoot the Wet Wednesday race that they would do. So we would, we would practice that way. And of course, surfing photography was part of that thing. Um, so that became a big element in the class. And then these large scale productions in the pools where they're using backdrops and they're using lights and things. And, but you see, there's no scuba tanks. So they're just breath holding this stuff. Um, so it's, it's a little harder. You can't get as many pictures off. But um, still, it was no problem. And they're using surf housings, not, um, that, which are you know, not that much less expensive. But they're certainly a lot lighter. Um, so they're not using the great big housings. But they learned about the type of makeup that would work underwater. They worked with professional underwater models. They learned about, and they learned themselves by modeling how a model needs to work underwater. Like, don't hold your breath. You got to let all the water, all the air out, and then make sure you wipe your nose so there's no bubbles under the nose because that's hard to retouch. <clears throat> and then you got to pose like a like a dancer, you know, feet, toes pointed, hands pointed, art, you know, the whole thing. And then how about the fabric that they're wearing? How does that look underwater? How do you move your head and keep your hair moving? Underwater models have an incredibly difficult job. <clears throat> and the students, by modeling themselves and then working with their own models, they learned this. And they created some absolutely beautiful work. So, um, so they would, we would rent pools, uh, private pools. Students would learn about insurance, um, about the safety features you know, um, that they had to follow. So they really learned the, how to do a full-scale professional production um, in the pool. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? And they would do product photography underwater. So, and then portraits. Lots of Photoshop work on that. Still, she's lit. She's, you know, she's lit from lights under the water and above the water. This is an Italian woman who works out of LA. And I mean, students were, you know, allowed to really do anything that they wanted as long as that camera was wet. So all of those are done in the pool. All of them are lit. And the, and so so the climax of the class was this five-day trip. Um, more than half the class did not scuba dive. More than half the class was women. This is a big change for people um, from my generation who were used to going out diving with a bunch of guys, you know. So the boat smelled way better. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily cleaner, but it sure smelled better. Um, and it was just a much more pleasant and civilized experience. The crew, the boat crew, loved it. They absolutely loved it. They weren't all guys, but most of them were guys. So they loved it. And there's several marriages that have come out of this class. Um, but anyway, so um, again, and, um, and, and we moved up to the conception so we could have more students. And we had about 20 students. So we would go out for five days. Students would pre-visualize ideas they wanted to create out on the five-day trip. So they would do storyboards, present them to the class. They would talk about safety and models and clothes. They would bring racks of clothes and fabric out on the boat and everything. And then, and then try, try to create what they had in their mind. As you well know, once you get in the water, everything changes. But some of the images that the students created were really incredible. I, I can't tell you how bad the conditions were for this shot because I was assisting on this shot. Both of these are crew members. They had to get naked and then put this seaweed on them. They were boyfriend, girlfriend, fortunately. Um, and the visibility was literally about six feet. So you're using wide angle lenses and getting very close. So really, the, the, it was amazing how well the students did in visualizing this. So here's an example, no scuba. So free diving, just going down, coming up, shoot, 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 shoot. Model poses. And uh, you do this time after time after time. <clears throat> and you finally get a couple of shots that work. Okay, there's light from below. There's light from behind her. And the students would come up with these really you know, incredible ideas. So that's a selfie, actually. 
he's holding the camera himself, but he had the guy pose above him. And then the mask, the light in the mask was photoshopped. Okay. And then some of the productions were very extensive, like this is a nighttime shoot, <clears throat> which is always interesting. And we're using, we had a working arrangement with um, Light in Motion, using their underwater Stella LED lights, which are incredible lights. And so there was like, I don't know, six or seven people working on this shoot trying to create this one shot of this crewman as a spear fisherman. Students would do product shots for their portfolios. Um, another product shot. So, so the, the, the bottle is shot separately, floating in the water. And then he was shot and then she puts it together. It would be literally, if, if he was actually holding the bottle, it, it would be much smaller, okay? So, so you, in order to get the product big, you, she had to do it this way. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. So, at this point, I was bringing out, so we'd go out, there'd be 20 students, and I was usually bringing somebody to say, hey, can my girlfriend come, can my boyfriend come? I said, well, yeah, they have to be able to swim really well and they have to be willing to model. So I usually allow two, a couple of extra people to come on the boat, I and mean, they had to model, and the models had the hardest job. We would schedule them during the day, so they were in the water maybe four or five hours a day modeling. So finally, one student came up to me and said, you know, I have a friend of mine and she's got a mermaid tail. Can she come out on the boat? <laughs> and I said, wow, that sounds cool. And I did a little homework, found out there are professional mermaids out there working, and there have been since the 50s. There was a place in Florida that had mermaids, and then there was actually a place on State Street that had a mermaid in a tank. Sharkies? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That was a Brooks student, by the way. Um, so anyway, so I said, yes, you can bring a mermaid. And this, this changed things a lot because, you know, mermaids have a culture, you know, they have a history and a culture, and, and um, they've become much more popular now than when we started with them. But I actually found three professional mermaids um, in Southern California who were willing to come out on the boat for the five days and, and uh, model for us. So. They have two different kinds of tails. Um, the one in the middle is a silicone tail, and then the one on the right is a monofin with a fabric tail pulled over it. So um, the silicone tail is really hard to get into. They have to put baby oil in there and slide that thing up, and then they can't move. They have to be carried everywhere uh, on land. <laughs> so um, yeah, one of those crew jobs that everybody was buying for. <laughs> um, but you can see the detail in the silicone, it's rubber, you know, you can see the detail in the, in the scales and the, and the fins and everything. And they can swim really well. I mean, way faster than, than someone kicking or with fins, way faster, no problem. And most of these uh, women who did this um, were incredible in the water. They could breath hold for two minutes, three minutes. Um, they could make it from the boat to shore two or three times faster than anyone else. Um, so, I mean, they had an incredibly difficult job, but they were so good at their job. And then the other thing is, is look, the divers and photographers are in full wetsuits and they're naked. <laughs> and, and, you know, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, you know. I don't have the shot yet, keep doing it. And, and so we would go to Catalina and San Clemente because I, be, I was looking for 70 degree water so that these women didn't freeze to death out there. And that's where our five day trips went to. Um, so, you know, a big, a big component of the, all this work was safety. So um, we always had safety divers in the water, even if, if the photographer and the model and all of it, they weren't on scuba, there were scuba divers in the water, uh, students who were the safety divers. And any time a model had to go deeper than they were comfortable, um, you know, they had to have a, a diver with a long regulator so the model could get air down there. 
And then we always had kayaks or surfboards or stand-up paddle boards so that the models could rest at the surface and hang on uh, or get out and try and warm up in the sun a little bit. And of course, always warm drinks and everything back on the boat because they, they would get very cold. Um, they would be in the water for you know, an hour at a time in those suits. So, but the whole culture of mermaids, students were able to come up with these ideas of creating images that reflect what painters had been doing. Um, sunset shoot, you know, we were lighting the, the model and everything. Um, this was a, a whole series this student did on, on the, you know, the, she finds the sailor and then he proposes to her and they get married um, underwater. So he did a series of shots like that. And then my role here was in working with the mermaids and all the models actually, was I would usually the first day kind of do a demo on using lighting techniques or posing techniques working with the model. So you can see here, um, we have our model in the water. It's not a very clean day, it's a little bit dirty, <clears throat> um, but it's overcast too, which really helped with our external lighting. And we've got these LED lights and um, I got them strapped to a, uh, an oar from the boat because I needed two of them because the length of her, this woman is about five foot ten and then the tail goes another two feet. So I had to cover the whole area with light. And you can see that it worked. I mean, um, and then you can see on the left shot there's a pole coming in with a light. Well, I, you just retouch the pole out. The light's still in there. This, this model was really impressive. So, and then the one on the right was taken with, with flash. It was, I brought her up into the shallows. I love the gold of the um, tail and it matched the algae color. Brought her up into the shallows. Now, now you gotta remember, it's not a swimming pool. You know, the water's just not calm. It's going up and down and up and down and swishing around and there's fish crawling around and seaweed. and. You know, it's, it, it doesn't look like that. Um, okay, so let me just run through a real quick little kind of scenario of how I approached. Um, I had an idea, I wanted to photograph a sleeping mermaid, like a scuba diver or a snorkeler was going along and they found a sleeping mermaid. Okay, so that's in my mind. So I go over it with the model. And so I get in the water and I have my assistant and my assistant paddles the paddle board over and my model just jumps in and well, she, I carried her in, and then she swims off um, and goes to a location. But she's got a mask. I give her a mask, okay? And I had gone and scouted this area um, uh, prior to when we went out, and I found a nice little spot that might work. And so I had her put the mask on, and then I show her what I want her to do. So I swim down there and pose like a mermaid. Um, I'm on scuba, and um, she goes, okay, I got it. And then she, she kind of goes down with the mask on so she can see. And I say, yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's try that. And then she goes and poses, and that's me right there. You can see with the lights and everything. I'm just staying there. I'm just waiting for her to come down. And then she goes up, swims around, comes back. And, you know, it doesn't always work. You know, we get some ideas, and, and you know, it, it might work. Well, that's kind of cool peeking over the top, but that's not really what I want. So eventually you get to where you get the picture that you want. <clears throat> you don't always get the picture of you want, but we had five days, so you can try it. We did not move very much. Another thing the crew liked, we're gonna anchor here and we're not moving for four days. <laughs> Whoa, you're kidding. I don't know if you've ever heard about how dive boats work, but that's not how they work. Um, so some of the, sometimes some of the problems we would run into in, in photographing underwater and photographing models in particular is these darn autofocus cameras now. They'll focus on the particulate matter in the water rather than the subject, especially if there's a lot of particulate matter. It's very frustrating. So th that's what happened here. You can see this is not in focus, okay? But I, I actually put this out on social media a little bit and said, hey, what do you think about this? I, I, I'm a, I do not like out of focus pictures. And, and so they came back and said, well, we kind of like it. It looks like an old, like you shot it on some old, old camera and, you know, and everything. So it's not out of focus, it's defocused. 
that, that's a technique on purpose. Defocus. But it, it did turn out to look like the old camera style, you know. But, but her posing is just incredible. So, and you can see how it's very shallow and everything. Um, but anyway, so the, the whole mermaid thing just blossomed. I'm still in touch with these mermaids. And um, uh, they are professionals. They make a living doing this, mainly parties and stuff like that. Um, but it's just, it's just really, it, and you can be a mermaid. You, you can go, there's a, in Hawaii, you can go to Hawaii and you can pay, put on the mermaid tail, and somebody will take pictures of you posing and swimming around, and guys can do it too, and little kids can do it. So there's a, a place in Florida that does it and a place in Hawaii that does it. Little girls just die for this stuff. So. Okay, so it, the name of this presentation is uh, Great Whites and Mermaids, so I have to transition from mermaids to Great Whites. So interestingly enough, I had two pictures that were very similar, um, and, uh, and that transitions to Great Whites. So um, this was my, it's one of my favorite great white shots. I shot this in um, 1999. It's on film. Um, and this is a female great white in Australia, Neptune Island. And she hit the cage and bent the bars. So um, that was interesting. Um, her mouth is opening so fast there's a vortex of air because she had come to the surface. So. Um, I spent about um, $6,000 for this trip. We went to Kangaroo Island and Neptune Island, and um, it's a lot of money at that time. I remember I'm doing stock photography. Nobody's paying me to do it. I'm going, oh, how am I going to get my $6,000 back um, to pay for that kind of trip? Well, I think overall the white sharks um, up to this point are well over 50 grand, you know. This trip alone, I had $13,000. You saw that one shot I showed you before. So, no problem. White sharks, when, any, when somebody says, we need a picture of a shark, they're only thinking of white sharks. Only. There's hundreds and hundreds of species of sharks, and all they're thinking of are white sharks. They'll even label it a white shark if it's not a white shark. <laughs> so, so, white sharks are very valuable commercially. So then, um, many years later, this is digital now, I took this uh, picture um, out of Guadalupe Island, which is an absolutely incredible experience. You don't have to scuba dive. Um, really old people and really young people can do this. Um, I, uh, Ernie was uh, in his, it is in his 80s, and he still goes and does this. That's Ernie's arm, Ernie Brooks' arm sticking out of the cage. You're not supposed to do that, by the way. Um, but, you know, it, so it, it's, it's an absolutely incredible experience to be in the water with these um, large animals. And it's, it's changed over the years. They now have cages that are, that are deeper now and shallow, so you can decide to do a deeper cage or a shallow cage. Um, and the, they, they don't really bait like they used to, you know, like throw chum. And the guys in Australia would dump buckets of blood over the top of us to get the sharks to come close. You can't do that anymore. Um, but anyway, so now the sharks just are there and they come around and they're curious. They're still scary, but they're, they're curious. Um, to be honest with you, after three or four days, I seriously felt like I could get out and swim with some of them. And that is happening now. <clears throat> There's two women in Hawaii that regularly go out and swim with these um, white sharks. They just... It, they, they know the behavior of the shark, and they know the sharks. But it is scary, so especially when they come up. Now, uh, Guadalupe has great visibility most of the time, but it's really interesting when one day you have really good visibility and you see the sharks coming around, and you never see very many at any time. And then the next day, you can't even see the sharks. The visibility has dropped so bad that they just come like ghosts out. And they're, and they're literally 10 feet away before you even see them. They are ambush predators. And they, um, they like dirty water because they, they can sneak up on their prey that way. 
So people ask, well, you dive out here, there's white sharks out there, and, and you know, aren't you afraid? Um, I'm, I, I, I am afraid. Um, it's a good thing to be out there, but I'm not afraid of, of a shark that I see. It's the one you don't see. <laughs> and fortunately, they're not, um, they haven't developed, um, you know, the old, I'm gonna, here, I'll swim around and make them watch me while you come from, they don't do that. <laughs> Fortunately. So anyway, wonderful trip. There is a whole display and all the information about sharks that I learned is up there. Um, they, they are fascinating animals. I do dive in warm water occasionally. Um, and this was a shot of a leafy sea dragon taken in Australia on that white shark trip. <clears throat> so these incredible animals. It's a relative of the seahorses. Right now I'm we go to Hawaii every couple of years, uh, and um, I, I'm, you know, I, I do some diving in Hawaii, but you know, I snorkel more than anything else. So I'm really into now trying to get great underwater photographs with on snorkel gear. And I love the shallow water, so I'm in six feet of water, um, chasing these fish around and waiting for the waves to break on top. So I'm doing shallow water, and then getting in with the mantas, um, snorkeling, because um, the mantas in the day will come up to the surface a lot of times. So these are in Hawaii. But I do do that crazy manta night dive in Hawaii. If, if you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. If you think you'll never do it because it looks like such a touristy thing, uh, it will change your mind. I, I do it every time I go now. It's so much fun. Um, you go down to the bottom of the ocean, they set up lights, and you all sit around in a circle, and mantas come play with you. So, um, so it's, it's amazing. <clears throat> so that's Hawaii. Um, I just did a, a trip down to Socorro for Ernie Brooks' 83rd birthday. So he was, he's still diving, he's 83 years old. <clears throat> he can't hear anymore, he can barely see, um, <laughs> but, uh, but he still dives. So he's passionate. And it's not, it's not a flat column. Look, look, I mean, look at that little boat, that's a big boat over there actually, and they're totally buried in these swells. And, but it's, it's phenomenal diving. Several people in the audience just got back on Tuesday from this trip. And it is a place where you can go and see big mantas, the Pacific manta. That's actually Ernie. He's that diver in the middle. And that's Ed Stetson, who is like Ernie's butler. He's holding his tank. He's holding his tank. And when Ernie would move, Ed would move him around. It was amazing to watch. <clears throat> and I remember one time looking over and Ed must have run out of air because he's got Ernie's octopus in his mouth. <laughs> so, but, but it's amazing, it's amazing that a, a, a man like Ernie can continue to dive. And it was wonderful being on the boat. There's Glenn Fritzler with his um, GoPro pole um, chasing a, a shark. But this is the vastness of this place, Socorro. Very sharky. <clears throat> This is a manta on, on a rock they call a boiler. These mantas can get up to 18 feet wingspans, the size of a small fighter jet, it's the largest mantas in the world. Uh, here's another friend of mine, Louis Preslin, and he's doing a selfie with a whale shark. <laughs> not, not really. He, he doesn't even know the whale shark's there. He's filming. <laughs> he, he's filming up. He's looking at a manta or something. Yeah, but doesn't it look like a selfie? I thought it looked like a selfie. So, and then there's big tuna there. This is um, yellowfin tuna, big. And, and they just got back, they said they saw a lot of 200 pounders, which is really big. <clears throat> but my favorite place is Channel Islands. So, um, you know, uh, um, I, I do a, a lot of work with Truth Aquatics, so I can run down, jump on the boat pretty much any time I want. I don't do it enough, I need to do it more. Um, this is Monty, he's in the audience as well, uh, cruising around um, underneath one of the boats. And one of the reasons why I love um, the Channel Islands and diving in California is the kelp beds. Um, they are incredible places to dive. Um, there, it's like a redwood forest. I mean, most of you may have been to a redwood forest, so you understand how majestic it is. Well, kelp beds are the same way. 
And um, the whole, um, I did a lot of work when I was a zoologist um, uh, on kelp, and uh, just the whole um, way this, this, it's an algae, okay, um, and it can grow up to two feet a day. Um, the whole way this plant exists is pretty incredible. That's the apical meristem, that's the growing end of the, of the kelp plant. Um, but one of the other things that's incredible about our waters is that literally every single surface, every rock is covered in life. Covered. It's a much richer environment than coral reefs. Um, and the creatures that live in those rocks and on those rocks, we got a moray, we got a sea lemon nudibranch, the snail on the right. On the lower left is a decorator crab that's decided to decorate his shell with tiny sponges. <clears throat> and yes, they, it, they can use those sponges to hide themselves, but it's really, it's lunch. When there's not very much food around, they'll, they'll pick the food <laughs> off their back and eat it. Um, and so, you know, and incredible. And then a little rockfish in, in a gorgonian. Tritonia festiva, the nudibranch. Um, and it's a swell shark embryo. And the swell sharks will actually lay their eggs on those gorgonians and the little tendrils will. Melaby, the lion's head nudibranch. This nudibranch lives on kelp blades. I don't know, you, if you, when you look at the kelp underwater, it's moving, right? All the time, flipping and flopping back and forth. These guys just hang on. Our water can be very dirty <coughs> um, and green. Um, so one day, I mean, I was in the water. You really can't take any pictures. I mean, it's green water. The visibility is a dirty 10 feet, which means you can really only see about five feet. <clears throat> and I was bored, and I was just doing the Ernie thing. I was sitting there waiting for something to swim by. I wouldn't have seen it anyway. Um, so there was a sunflower star, which are big, crawling along. So I said, well, you know, I'm going to take the sunflower star and throw it up in the water column and take some pictures. <laughs> So, so I did. I just took them and I threw them up there and click, 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 click. I got a whole bunch of them. And, and he always landed properly. Um, so I took some pictures and put them back and let them cruise. This is a fearsome creature in the water. <clears throat> this thing eats everything it touches. You'll see brittle stars just parting, you know, as fast as they can as these guys cruise through. Anyway, huge um, amount of fun with that sunflower star. Calico bass, which is one of the favorites for spear fishermen. This is my son um, snorkeling. You know, a lot of people snorkel now rather than scuba, um, or they do both, because you can snorkel without worrying about dive time. But again, I found a really beautiful spot, and it had a Garibaldi nest there, so the Garibaldi's just going to swim around in circles and get pissed off. Um, but I know he'll be there when I need him. Um, and it's a male. The males guard the nest. Um, and so I just told my son, I said, hey, you need to go and snorkel by here and wait till that Garibaldi gets him. So, so we set it up. These creatures are just wonderful. <laughs> it's our official state marine fish. They're protected. They have no fear. And it's really a good thing they're not a lot bigger. Um, they will attack a diver. Um, actually hit a diver if the diver is too close to their nest. And that's the males. So, really amazing. Harbor seals? Ernie loved, I don't know why harbor seals loved Ernie so much. I mean, I, I do believe they like women more than men. I mean, you gotta remember, I, I, I'm, I've been diving out there with, you know, fairly large groups of men and women, watch them, and invariably the harbor seals will swim over to the women they don't look any different underwater. Swim over to the women and not the men. And they'll grab your fins and hug you, and those are the little ones. But they're very curious, solitary. Uh, soup fin sharks out at San Clemente. Um, another one of my favorites, the giant sea bass, now protected. And they are big. I think the record was seven feet and 600 pounds or something. They're huge. They're really scary. They're like a giant dog. You know, they'll follow you around, and you won't know it because they're really stealthy. <clears throat> um, there are relatives of these fish that have eaten people in the South Pacific. 
so I try and make these scary pictures of them. <laughs> My homage to Ernie Brooks, you know, his black and white underwater work <clears throat> with the sea lions, and again, a spot, a pretty spot, you know, I'll sit here for a while, see what happens, and sea lions were doing that, and that's Casino Point out of Catalina. And then this is my favorite dive location in the Channel Islands. I haven't been to all of them or anything. It's at San Clemente Island. It's really shallow. Literally, at low tide, it's less than two feet. I, I, I have to snorkel. I can't scuba because the tank's out of the water and it's too heavy. So, but it's covered in algae and it can be very, very clear. And the leopard sharks come here and congregate because um, they give live birth and they think that the leopard sharks go into the bays and the shallow areas where the warm water is and it, it helps the babies develop in their stomach and then they'll, they might move a little deeper to give birth, but, but almost guaranteed leopard sharks. And then there's incredible plant life there, the algaes and sea grasses, so you know, you just stay in that area and just get creative. It is a beautiful place. So. You know, it's all about the, our connection in the water. Um, the, the ocean is a very healthy environment to live near and to be on, and the opportunities to work and see with see all these animals really makes this whole thing of underwater photography. Oh, thank you. So, questions. Okay, so the question, um, the question is one day can be clear and one day the visibility clear and, and the next day it's a poor visibility. Um, you know, that was specifically Guadalupe Island and it's an it's a oceanic island, it's offshore and there's probably, they're probably less able to predict that. The visibility out here is easy to predict, like after a rain it's going to be bad, you know, because all that stuff flows in and then the tides high tide and low tide affect visibility because it brings the water closer to the islands or further away. Um, uh, plankton in the springtime, we get the winds in the springtime produce our plankton blooms. They create upwellings from the bottom of the ocean. That's why the whales are there. Um, and so the water can be green and dirty in the springtime. Uh, whereas wintertime is generally clear and you know, mid-summer it can be clearer. So th it is predictable in a, in a localized area. Yes? Okay, have, have I or anyone else published a book on mermaid photographs? Not that I know of. I... You know you have. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to do a mermaid exhibit here one of these days, but I got to take more mermaid pictures. <laughs> Where's Socorro? Socorro? Yeah. Um, it's the Rivajedo Archipelago. It's 280, is that, is that about right? Yeah, 280 miles southwest of, of the tip of Baja, Cabo. 280 miles southwest of uh, Cabo San Lucas, out in the middle of the ocean. It's part of that oceanic island chain, the Galapagos and Guadalupe and Socorro and um, uh, yeah, there's several islands. You know. So it's part of those chains. It's not part of the Hawaiian chain. It's a different, it's a different mountain range. Uh, did I ever encounter, you, you mean white sharks, right? <laughs> um, otherwise, yes, we saw lots of other kinds of sharks, but um, no, I, I, I've been, I, I learned how to dive, um, LA County um, uh, dive program, uh, which was the first certifi certifying agency um, in the world. Um, and I learned through them in 1968, I think it was, and, and that was in the Channel Islands, and I've been diving the Channel Islands my whole life. I have never seen a white shark underwater. I have seen one from the surface. I was on the boat. There are people in this room who have seen white sharks out there underwater. Um, there are 
I believe, more white sharks out there now than there were 20 years ago. Um, part of climate change, the waters have been warmer, and the, white, the baby white sharks, six-foot babies, have been moving up from Mexico. So perfectly natural, they don't eat people or marine mammals. They eat flatfish and chase fish around the shallows, but it's kind of scary sometimes to see these drone shots of six or seven, six to eight foot white sharks swimming around off our beaches. But, like I said, it's not a problem. The ones you see are not a problem. I'm sure of it. Any other questions for Alf? Okay, so the question is, is what size, in other words, it has to do with the camera sensor, what size pixels, what size sensor do you need for image clarity? Um, the, the sensor size doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the clarity. The lens has a lot to do with the clarity. Um, you know, the better the lens, the, the better the image that will be created be created on any sensor size. I do use, um, now I use full frame sensors, which, so which is the larger sensor, but I, I started my digital photography with a small sensor camera, and today's small sensor cameras, um, uh, these mirrorless systems, um, absolutely incredible, you know, the sharpness and clarity. Um, it has to do with what what do, you, what do you want to do with the picture? You want to make four foot canvases up there, you're going to need a big sensor. But if you are just sharing it on computers and the internet and making small prints for an album maybe, you, you don't need that. You don't need that. You can easily go with the smaller sensors, easily. And, and again, it, it has nothing to do with the clarity. It's whether you, um, you know, clean water or good wide angle lenses, um, that's the biggest thing, is good wide angle lens. Spend your money on your lenses, not on your camera. Who now is the leading underwater photographer? <laughs> I'm very happy that I am pro-tired. Um, the question is, who is now the leading underwater photographer? There's a whole new batch of underwater photographers out there. Um, uh, they're probably in their 40s, you know, really, they're in their 40s, okay, so they're at the peak of their career. Um, there's still some old-timers shooting, David Dubelet is still shooting, old-time National Geographic shooter, but, you know, you don't see much of his work anymore um, out there. Um, there's probably a half a dozen that, on social media especially, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I would have to go and do a little bit of homework. I have some that I have in mind, um, but I forgot their names right now. There's no specific school anymore. Right? No, school. there is no school. There is no school. You're going you're gonna to have to learn it on your own. One in the back. Yeah, that's, I've been asked this a couple times tonight. So some of you may have heard that, you know, Brooks is resurrected at UCSB. That is not true. <laughs> okay, so what has been resurrected is Ernie Brooks has uh, founded an organization, the Ernest Brooks Foundation, and um, uh, there's a board that, that um, you know, governs that foundation, and it's, it's had, it, it's really new, um, it's less than a year old really, and, and education is a component of what the foundation does, and through an association of Brooks alumni um, and the University of California, the, we have uh, started teaching some courses in their extension program. The only real connection to Brooks is that they're taught by Brooks, former Brooks faculty. The courses themselves are not Brooks courses, they can't be. Um, there's no prerequisites for these courses, you know, it's just one course. 
Um, and of course, Brooks was a three-year bachelor's degree program where you could enroll at Brooks and never have taken a picture in your entire life, and you would graduate as one of the top commercial photographers in the world. So there's no way of duplicating that without starting a school. So if anybody wants to start a school, then this organization is the one to talk to. Um, but also the archives at Brooks, the Brooks Alumni Association, all that when the school closed very abruptly, um, all that was sort of left dangling out there. Brooks was in business for 75 years, had a huge impact on the visual world uh, over that period of time. And the Ernie Brooks Foundation is, is, is trying to carry that uh, legacy on into the future. I hope that answered the question. We're here one more time for Ralph. Yeah.